How many of you guys are ready for the keyboard festival? Yes. That's my first uh, memory that I was able to make with you when I came as the new pastor. I made sure I was here for that. I got here two or three days before the keyboard festival, and I look forward to it every year. Thankful for Pastor Mike and the team. Uh, they got some special things up their sleeves for you. Be sure to grab those, those cards, those in the seat backs in front of you. Get those keyboard festival uh, cards. Be sure to distribute them. Uh, we will print more. You, you distribute them, we'll print some more. Also want to pay special attention to one thing. We are not having a Friday evening uh, keyboard festival. Instead, we're going to do one more additional keyboard festival Sunday morning. So that first week of December, <clears throat> we will not be having a 9 a.m. service. We will be only doing the keyboard festival at 11 a.m. So be sure to be a part of that. Uh, pretty pumped. And also, I, I have no qualms about this. Download the app. Ignore me for the next minute or two minutes. Everybody download the app. And uh, be sure to leave it to where we can send notifications. We won't do it very often, uh, but we'll do it. There's times where it's the easiest way to communicate something that's urgent or special in the church uh, through the app. And every, it's just a one-stop digital shop for everything that you need. So exciting stuff. Turn to the person next to you and say this. Pastor Betzer is speaking this Wednesday. Don't miss it. Excited about that. And uh, that whole month will be a missions emphasis month on Wednesday and a special Sunday later in the month, just a missions emphasis. Uh, we're all about reach, teach, and send. Amen? And we'll continue to do so. Turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5, online as well. Turn with me in your Bibles. We're continuing in part 7 of this fruitful series, going through the nine different fruits of the Spirit of God. The subtitle is God's Spirit Through You. That these aren't just nine attributes of God's nature, they're nine attributes of God's nature that can flow in and through your life. We talk about nine fruits, nine precious jewels, or if you can show the picture of a, the prism, it's like nine different colors or expressions or attributes of God's nature that we can be like him and love like him and, and do what he does in the way that he does it, that his spirit melds with our spirit and we get to begin to have the attributes of our Heavenly Father. Isn't it awesome to think about that? It's absolutely awesome. Read it with me, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, agape love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Say it with me. Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. That when you're full of the Spirit of God and you're just letting those attributes flow through your life, there is a freedom to where we're not having to think about the don'ts because we're doing what's right and being what's right because of God's Spirit inside of us. Last week we talked about goodness, and this week we're going to be talking about faithfulness. The Greek word is pistis. It's the word for faith. It honestly is... This has been probably the most difficult of, of the seven so far that I've done. This has been by far the most difficult because it is a common word in the New Testament. It is hundreds of times that word faith is mentioned. Why? Because it is the foundation for our Christian religion and Christian belief. It, is, it undergirds everything that we are. Our faith is based on faith. Say it with me. My faith is based on faith. And the word pistis means a lot of things. It means trust. It means confidence. It means conviction. It means belief. It means doctrine. It means so many things. But it is absolutely critical and foundational if you're going to have a faith relationship with Jesus and live it up. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says this. And without faith, and every time you see that word faith in big capitals, it's the Greek word pistis. And without faith... It is impossible to please God, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. It's not just a mental thing and a heart thing. It's not that you just believe him cognitively, but that you are seeking him with all that you are. That this word faith is, is what? It's a noun. One of the things I remember from childhood in, in elementary school, the nouns and verbs and adjectives. What is a noun? It's a person, place, or thing. Faith is a thing. Faith is a something. 
It is a noun. It is, it is substantive. It is weighty. It is something that you can receive. It is something that you can possess. And it starts with God. People think faith is just positive thinking towards something. And I remind people when people say, Pastor Russ, do you have faith for this? And it depends. If God's word already gives me a promise that God will do something or, or the other, then yes, I do. But if it's not something spelled out specifically in God's word, I will not say I have faith for something unless God speaks it to me. Why? Faith starts, originates, and comes from God. It's a gift from God. Ro- um, Hebrews, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ Jesus. So faith is something that starts with God, originates from God. It's from him. It's his spirit. And he deposits it in your spirit. His spirit connecting with your spirit. Like I said, it's not just a cognitive belief or an emotional exercise. It is something that you receive and becomes a part of you. How many of you know what I'm talking about? When you came into faith with Jesus Christ, something clicked. Something happened on the inside. Something was there that wasn't there before. I put it like this. When you hear the truth about Jesus and about God's love for you, about who he is and and what he's done for you and who he is for you, you have to make a decision, and you can make a decision to receive his faith. I want you to hear this. Receive his faith for your life. When you have faith for something for your life, if it's from God, it's his faith for your life. So it's always going to be bigger. It's always going to be greater. It's always going to be more beautiful because it originates with God. And it changes everything. You will no longer think the way you did before. You will no longer value the way you did before. You will no no longer perceive or see things the way you did before. How many know when you came to Christ, it was like a new world. It was like a new life. I'm not just living a nine to five or an eight to five job existence for a paycheck. I've got a purpose. I'm not living for just 70, 80, 90, 100 years on this this blue ball spinning around the sun. I got an eternal life waiting for me. All of a sudden, you see life differently. Made me think of one of my favorite, non favorite infomercials when I was a kid in the 80s. Anybody remember blue blockers? Who invented blue blockers? It was like every other commercial was those blue blockers. Remember how ugly they were? These ugly sunglasses with just a bright yellow tinted lens. But those people suckered us, didn't they? Guys out there fishing, wow, I've never seen the fish like this before. Everything's clearer, brighter. A whole new world. I mean, it's like Disneyland, right? It changed my life, right? Right? But I like this one better. This is much more powerful. Have any of you ever seen the modern miracle that they've made technologically where they've made glasses that people that are colorblind can see in color for the first time? Has anybody seen that? If you haven't, please go to YouTube, Google it. I saw this little child who was colorblind from birth when they put those glasses on that child. And that's exactly what it is. It's like you were living in black and white before, and then all of a sudden, the light and the love of the Spirit come into your life, and you're seeing in rainbow colors the beauty that everything God has for you. Amen? Amen. But it's substantive. It's something weighty, something that you have. I put it like this. Faith becomes something that's in you. You own faith, and it owns you. It's like that seed that the Bible talks about that if we have faith as a mustard seed, that, that pistis, if we have his faith like a mustard seed, it germinates in something beautiful and big and, and much broader. What happens? That, that all of a sudden our fruitless lives become fruitful lives. That God's spirit doesn't just stop with you, that it can grow. And not just in who you are, but it affects the people that are around you. And how your faith grows completely depends on whether you release it or not. Here's my catchy little phrase phrase for today. Faith grows where it flows. 
How do you get increased faith? How do you get increased faithfulness? Is by, by releasing it and letting it grow. That linear aspect of the fruits of the Spirit, I want you to look at it with me one more time because you have to choose not to let God's Spirit stop at any one of these attributes. So it begins with God's fullness and Spirit coming and loving you. If you guys can put that on the screen. God's Spirit leads to love, that, that agape, charitable love, which leads to kara, divine, long-lasting joy, which leads to that, that, that shalom, peace. I forgot the, the Greek word for the peace there, meaning completeness and wholeness. And when everything is well with your soul and you've got the joy of the Lord, all of a sudden you have that macrothumia. You have that conquering endurance and patience. And then you have kindness. When everything is well with inside of you, and you're right with God, and you have his love, and, and you know that it is well with your soul, all of a sudden, you're able to see others instead of yourself. And you release it, what? Through kindness. And that kindness, in turn, turns to goodness. We talked about it this last week, and that when you're allowing God's goodness and his character to define you, he turns back and he continues to grow. And what happens when God's goodness and character is growing inside of you? You immediately become more faithful. Why? Because God is faithful. We just sang the song about his goodness, and his goodness leads to what? His faithfulness. We'll sing that song at the very end. So catch this. First and foremost, that word uh, faith, pistis, means faith, but it also means faithfulness. Say faithfulness. Here's how it works. How do you let it grow? How does it flow? Romans chapter 1, verse 16 you're going to have to read it slowly and look at the prepositions. Paul is speaking. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the gospel, the word of God, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith, and this is that pistis word every time, for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Are you noticing that? Three times it's mentioned in half of a sentence. Anybody got it? Wow, that's pretty good. It took me about an hour to get it. So I'm going to slow it down. So this is the way I'm going to say it. God's character is being revealed in you from his face given to you for faithfulness through you, through him, who make, who, I'm sorry, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Can I get a water, please? Thank you. And by his continued faith in you. Thank you, Pastor Jason. So it starts from him, and he deposits it in you. You choose to release it in faithfulness, but you are only able to be faithful by his faith for you and through you. Is that good? It's that scripture, from you, to you, and through you are all things. So what's your and my job? Our job is to seek God, hunger for it, and receive his faith. And then our job is to release or to share in faithfulness, and God will be faithful to do all that through, all the way through. So there's two aspects. This is what's so hard. Hundreds of mentions of that word in the New Testament, and here's my food analogy for the day. Are you ready? How many of you guys like lobster rolls? My dad's back in town. He loves lobster rolls. This is a whale roll. This is like trying to bite off an entire whale. I could do a whole series on just that word, right? But this is what it breaks down to. Faith is re revealed in every single one of the scriptures in two categories. First and foremost, it is a theological virtue that you have faith in God. You see God for who he is. You surrender to him and you believe in him. That's your theological belief in God. But in Galatians chapter 5, he's using that same word along with all of these other ones. It's an ethical virtue. All the fruits of the Spirit are what God does through you in your living for him and through your living to others. Are you guys catching that? It's what you do with the faith that's deposited in you that we're going to focus on. And what you do is you bear fruit. Like that seed, it bears fruit and it multiplies I was thinking about this part about seeds and multiplying and faith and this and that, and I couldn't help getting back to one of my favorite guys in history, Johnny Appleseed. You guys remember Johnny Appleseed? Remember about learning about him when you were a kid? This crazy guy with a tin, like a, a pot on his head for a hat, 
going around planting apple trees, and you're going, is this guy mentally ill or something? What's up with this guy, right? They made songs about him. He's almost like this, you know, cartoon character. No. I actually studied up on it. You can also Wikipedia it and just do a, a, a brief thing after church. It's fascinating. He was born in Lemonster, Massachusetts, which I've been there before. I have a pastor friend when we were in Boston. I went up and visited it. Born in Lemonster, Massachusetts, and he was just this peaceable young man who loved nature. He was all about nature, and he became an arborist. He, he, he became an expert in plants, and guess what he specialized? Apples. And he started making apple orchards, and he became very successful. People thought he didn't have any money because he wore, like, tattered clothes, and he walked barefoot everywhere, right? He actually was a person of means, had good money. But what he did was he was making all this money, and he gave it up because he had faith and he had an idea. That it wasn't just going to be about him being successful. He had a vision that this is a huge country, and there's a whole wild frontier out there, and all these generations are going to be moving westward, and people are going to be living in the land, and, and he had this idea, wouldn't it be great if there were apple trees everywhere for the frontiers people to have for food? Go look at the history. They would go with the provisions, and how many of them starved to death on the trail? How many of them ran out of their stale crackers and their salted pork? And instead, there were apple trees that, were met, that met them. I want you to see this. He took two canoes, lashed them together, and filled two canoes full of seeds. And he went down the rivers and into the wilds of America. And he planted apple trees and orchards in West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and all the way to Ontario. Isn't that cool? And it hit me, how many of those trees not only fed people for the next hundred years, how many apples did those trees produce? How many of those trees still exist today or those apple orchards exist today? Can you think of the exponential impact this guy had because he thought big. He thought of taking what God had given him and he did more. But here's the part I never knew. He was actually a really strong Christian. He not only was going around and doing acts of service and, and doing good works for generations to come, everywhere he went, he was sharing the gospel of Jesus and bringing gospel literature to people. Go read your history. He was a self-funded missionary with a big vision that we still talk about today. But it all started with faith. Listen to this quote. Though you can easily count the seeds in an apple, it's impossible to count the apples in a seed. One more time, though you can easily count the seeds, and I'm going to say in an act of faithfulness, it's impossible to count the faith that comes out of that faithfulness. Everything that you have in you, God has designed to multiply through you. God is a God of multiplication. God is a God of exponential power. God is a God of exponential love. He's a God that never stops flowing, never stops moving, and he desires to do it in and through you. It's his nature. You guys ever think about the stars in the sky and the universe is expanding, right? And he did that with just one word, let there be light. You know what scientists have just discovered? We all know that the universe is expanding, but do you know that it's actually accelerating? It's not slowing down. It's not and slowing down as it expands. It's accelerating as it expands. Everything that God does, he breathes life into it. And imagine what he wants to do in and through the new creation that he's done by his spirit in you. Amen? I want you to think big, dream big, hunger big, and say, God, don't let your goodness stop with me. Help me to be more faithful. So let's look at that. True faith leads to faithfulness, point number one, through your good works. We're going to see four categories that you see that word faith broken down into, and I can barely just touch on them briefly. But this is what faithfulness looks like. Number one, through your good works. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, Paul is speaking. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. When you're thinking about your life and you're thinking about your purpose, we often boil it down to just having a job, having a family, and we narrow those boxes. 
God's word says that why you were born, part of the reason why you were created is for his goodness to be displayed through your life through good works. And that last part, that last phrase is just saying that you will walk in them, right? Well, how does it, he finished that? He says, so that we should walk in them. What does that mean? That means that we should be faithful to do them. It's the same concept. How many realize that increasing joy as you're doing good works? We've been talking about this the last two weeks, so I'm not going to mow that row very fast. Mow that row again, but we've been talking about acts of kindness, talking about acts of goodness, and this just literally means keep on doing those kind acts, keep on doing those acts of goodness, because that's why God created you. He created you that you get to be a part of showing his goodness in a dark and evil world. Like we said, you can do it with a cup of water. You can do it with sharing a meal. You can do it with an encouraging word. You can do it with a phone call. You can do it with sharing resources. There's so many things that we're seeing. Pastor Kerry just gave a testimony about how many different ministries, how many different Christians are working to help women that probably didn't feel valued, probably didn't feel loved. How many of you think they think a little differently today? Because somebody cared. Because somebody had the love of God in them. Somebody decided to show acts of kindness, show acts of goodness, and we're faithful to do that. You don't, it, what we think, we are always looking for the profound, but what actually is profound is found in the simple. And we can do it every single day. So keep doing it. That's one of the great things that's happened out of Hurricane Ian. How God's turning a bad thing into something good is people are being activated in acts of kindness and doing good works that never really did them like that before. And you're getting addicted to it. Keep doing it. When everybody gets settled, guess what? People still need acts of kindness until Jesus comes. Amen? Number two, true faith leads to faithfulness through your finances and your resources. Matthew chapter 24, verse 45. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes to them. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. That so doing means being faithful to his task. What's God talking about here? He's talking about when he comes to this world and he comes back again and he looks at each one of us. Are we stewarding what he put under our possession that's actually his? You see, everything that you think you have and I think that I have actually isn't ours. It belongs to him. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it and all who are in it. Why? Because he established it upon the seas and founded it upon the waters. He has creative rights, ownership rights, and he's God. It's his. So what we think we own, we don't own. What we actually are are stewards. And this text is saying that the resources that God's given you, he's going to come and see to make sure that you're feeding others, that you're taking care of others besides yourself. What is our world obsessed with? What is Western society obsessed with is that we accumulate, that we amass, that we absorb, that we can get whatever we want for ourselves. And he says that's not what he wants. He wants to bless. He says that there's seed for sowing and there's seed for bread. And the seed for bread is for our consumption, but the seed for sowing is to help others. And that literally means, hey, that Russ doesn't just take care of Russ. The Russ puts God first in his life with his tithes and offerings. That God, God help me in my stewardship of our finances with my wife. We're both income earners. That we are taking care of our family. We're taking care of our kids. We're taking care of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're taking care of our neighbors. We're taking care of those that don't have as much. Because if we're honest, we all have something to give. And God is saying, just make sure that when I come, that you're being faithful that you're not just making everything you have about you. Are you guys with me? And he says, and when you've done that, look what happens. There's a blessing that comes inside of that. That means that we have enough for ourselves, but we also make sure that we have enough for others, that we budget, we live within our means, we don't live beyond our means. We don't go into debt on depreciating assets and things like that. We can do something on on financial stewardship at another time. But the main thing is is that we live below our means and we have enough to share. Amen? Amen. Number three, true faith leads to faithfulness through your work or in your workplace. Luke chapter 16, verse 10. 
Listen to this progression. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. You notice he didn't say those who are faithful in much will be faithful with little. You don't want to know why? Because that's the problem. Most of us are faithful in the much. If we're being honest, it's that we're not being faithful in the little. Guilty as charged, right? Every one of us focus on the big things, but he's saying pay attention, be faithful in the little things. And look how he describes it. Verse 12, and if you have not been faithful in that, okay, I should read the rest of verse 10. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. Verse 12 explains it. And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's or another person's, who will give you that which is your own? God is basically saying, you want me to bless you, you have to bless others and how you treat their stuff before you can believe me to increase your stuff. What's he talking about? He's talking about a person that is a servant to a master. He's talking about somebody that has a boss, somebody that they're working in somebody else's business. And he's saying, you're not being faithful in your workplace. Then how do you expect me to bless you in that which is your own? You bless others first, and I'll make sure that I'm going to bless you. How many of us do our absolute very best every single day at a job that we can't stand? Most people are just like, I'm going to work just enough to where I don't get fired. Anybody else notice that things are changing in the work culture in America? I mean, if you have a heartbeat and you're willing to stand behind a cash register, you can have a job today. If you show up, they'll pay you, even if you do a bad job. Why? It's supply and demand, right? But we don't raise or lower our levels according to the cultural pressures or environment. God is saying he wants us to do our very best for other people in our workplace. At, whether it's a small business or whether it's Best Buy or some big company, they're all owned by somebody and we should be working hard for them like we would want somebody to work hard for us. I think one of the greatest examples in the Bible is Joseph. Talk about a guy that had every good reason not to do a good job. He sold into slavery by his brothers. He sold to a guy named Potiphar as a slave. He ends up working really hard for Potiphar, and Potiphar puts him over his entire household. Then Potiphar's wife is like, hey, he's a good-looking guy, and she tries to have a relationship with him. He says, no, he runs away. She says, oh, he tried to have an affair with me. And the guy who did nothing wrong gets what? Put in prison. How many think I would be feeling a little sorry for myself? I would be talking to God. But in prison, he was faithful with the little responsibilities that he had to where they kept putting more and more things underneath him. The next thing you know, he's running the whole prison. And then God at the right time calls him out of the prison. He goes to Pharaoh and he ends up having the solution to a famine that saves the known world at that time. And he ends up being number two over all of Egypt and over the known world at that time. Why? Because he was faithful with little, even when he was completely wrong. Are you guys with me? So at work, we should treat the owner's business as if it were the Lord's. At work, whether we're still in a job, whether we're retired and volunteering and stuff, we should do everything that we do as unto the Lord. I'm going to ask a few questions. Are you giving your boss their money's worth? Are you dependable? Are you trustworthy? Are you hardworking? Are you doing things in excellence? Is your boss thrilled to have you? Can I tell you, when you have somebody that's underneath you that does their job in excellence, it is a gift from God. When I was pastoring in Boston, we had almost no staff. And pastoring a decent sized church in Boston, horrible debt load, giving was super low. We had no money, almost no staff. And I can tell you this, there were two people on that staff. There were several that were faithful, but there were two people on that staff that I thanked. There was a lady that was in charge of the accounting, and there was a guy that was in charge of maintenance. And they were so good at their jobs. They did it to such high levels of excellence. They were analytical. They took initiative. They did things to excellence. They were hardworking. They were always looking for cost-saving initiatives. I could go on and on and on and on. And after three months to four months, I realized I don't even need to pay attention to what they're doing. They're doing it better than I ever could have dreamed or imagined. And I said, thank you. I don't even have to think about what you do. Such an amazing gift. 
If you do that for your boss in the secular world, don't you think they're going to see something's different about you? Something different about your character? They're going to see the faithfulness of God through you. And God can bless that business through you just like he blessed Egypt through Joseph. Amen? Number four, true faith leads to faithfulness through your witness. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, pay attention to this, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak. In other words, they received faith, so the natural thing is to share faith. Colossians chapter 1, verse 6. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, the word of God, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit, listen to this, and increasing as it also does among you since the day you heard it, and understood the grace of God in truth. Here's the point. When you and I really receive the true gospel, the faith that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation, that he's the son of God, that he died on a cross, a sinless death, he paid the penalty for all of our sins and mistakes, that there is forgiveness and that there is goodness and that his spirit can come to live in our lives and that we can live with him for eternity... The natural thing is to share that good news with anybody that is willing to listen. Folks, yes, I think you and I need to have a fresh look at the faith of Jesus Christ that's inside of me and you. Because your life and my life is a living testimony of his grace. A living testimony of his power. A living testimony of his transforming abilities in our lives. And the people around us are desperate. If you fully see and receive that faith in Jesus Christ, the natural thing, as Paul is saying, that you immediately did and that you're increasingly doing. The New Testament churches, can you believe it? It's that song, I've got a Savior and he's living in me. And the sad fact is, is Barna Research says 90% of people that claim to be born again evangelicals don't share their faith. And Paul says, if you have faith, you will share it. So I want you to let God activate inside of you something greater. To realize that there's other people because you and I, you know what we are? Every single one of us is a testimony of somebody else sharing and living out their faith that we are sitting here today rather than going to some brunch by ourselves or watching TV again another day. Amen? God has given you a mission field wherever you live, wherever you are, that every one of us is called to reach, teach, say it with me, and send. Amen. So share it. Don't keep it to yourself. Let there be a back pressure of the love of God spreading in and through you, multiplying just simply your testimony, living it out, showing the love of Christ through acts of goodness and sharing the love of Christ. This is what I think is a problem. When we're dealing with the issue of faithfulness, I think a lot of us struggle Because a lot of us haven't seen the faithfulness come our way that we think we should by other people. Like we have our faith with the Lord, but sometimes we're not necessarily being as faithful as we we could with other people. And I want you to realize you're actually more faithful than you think. And other people are more faithful than you think. We just have a tendency to magnify the negative and focus on that which didn't happen rather than what happened. And I saw this illustration that I think is pretty interesting it goes like this, if things were right only 99.9% of the time, this is what life would look like. If things were right only 99% of the time, there would be two unsafe landings at Chicago O'Hare Airport every day. And there isn't 
Can we just give an applause for our pilots right now, wherever you are online? Buddy Johnson, in case you're watching. 99.999% of the time, they're landing those planes right. Thank you, Jesus. If things weren't going right only 99.9% of the time, 20% 20,000 incorrect drug prescriptions would be given out every year. Over 500 incorrect surgeries would happen every week rather than being rare. And this is a big one, are you ready? If things were going were right only 99.9% .9 of the time, every single one of you listening to this online as well, you would have 32,000 heartbeats that would be missing every year. How many know that that's not your testimony? I don't think about my heart as much as I should. My wife talks about heart healthy. I don't like those two words together. But I don't think about my heart that much, do you? But what about on a quiet night when you're laying on your pillow and the AC isn't kicked on and everything's still, and all of a sudden you hear this strange blub blub, blub blub, blub blub, and you're like, I got a heart. And it's beating. And what if it stopped? Blub, blub. Oh, there it is again. Thank you, Jesus. Blub, blub. What's going on in my heart? Blub, blub. I'm not working out as much as I should with my heart. Blub, blub. If it only worked 99.9% .9 of the time, we'd all have heart arrhythmia, but we don't. Blub, blub. I know some people that have gotten stints. Do I need stints? Blub, blub. What's my cholesterol rating, right? Blub, blub. How many realize that you've been breathing in and out for an entire 35 to 40 minutes without even thinking about it. And your heart has beaten how many thousand times while you've been sitting here faithfully. And God has given you the air you breathe and the heart that's beating inside of you and a spirit that is engaging with your spirit. And every one of us looks like we've all been eating pretty well. And we got water to drink and we got cars to drive. We have roofs over our head. God has been faithful. And some of you, you've been faithful too. A lot of you. You know, the church couldn't be the way it is without faithful people. The church isn't a pastor. The church is the body of Christ. I'm just the one that gets to talk more than anybody else. This church wouldn't exist if it wasn't for decades and decades of faithfulness of people that are sitting in this church. There's some of you been here over 40 years, here every week, worshiping every week, giving every week, serving almost every week, for decades. Some of you multiple years. Some of you been here a year or two years. I know somebody that just recently got saved, and they're serving like crazy, and they're loving it, and they're taking the legacy that was passed on to them and what was invested in them, and it's being multiplied through them, and it's still happening. I can go down the list of some of the volunteers that I know, but I also can say what I see on a regular basis. Faithfulness isn't just doing it, it's how you're doing it. Right? The fruits of the Spirit is being right and doing right and doing right in the right way. And faithfulness is keep on being right and keep on doing right and keep on doing right in the right way. And that's what faithfulness is, is the continuation of the character and the nature of God and then through you. And there's not a lot of fanfare in it, but it makes a big difference. Staff member here, I've told them one time, but I think they deserve public recognition. There's a lot of things that have to happen for a church just to take place. And I can talk about a lot of people, but there's just one person that goes above and beyond their job portfolio. When there's a need, the person somehow is always filling it. If somebody else doesn't show up that was supposed to be volunteering in a completely different ministry, they're doing it. And I see them do it again and again, and they just get her done. They get it done. And then we had this uh, incredible fall festival yesterday. It was so fun. It was so awesome. I noticed that person that was only supposed to be there for an hour or two, but somebody else didn't show up or something happened. That person worked, that, worked their setting up and then worked from 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. and it wasn't their job. And her name's Ashley Thomas. Where are you, Ashley? I see it some of the time. My wife sees it even more because she gets to watch you. That's faithfulness. 
That's faithfulness. You don't have to hold a microphone. I can tell you, in missions giving, she is so detailed. She's so observant. She has so many insights. I don't even have to think about it. And I trust her. And you can trust giving through her because she's faithful. How is she faithful? She's got Jesus and she makes a decision to be faithful. But she also had a great example, Pastor Dave and Chris Thomas. 33 or 34 years almost. Faithful. Wanted to retire two years before I got here. Faithful. Want to make sure that they're here for the church and for Pastor Betzer through an incredibly difficult time. Then the new guy shows up, and I thought they were younger than they were. When I found out how old they were, I got nervous. I was like, how much longer are you willing to work? And he's like, well, I'm happy to be here to transition, whatever, whatever needs for the church. But he would like to take a break. He still wants to help, but he would like to help less. I said, well, you write your ticket, whatever. We'd like to keep you as long as we can. You do whatever you want. The problem is, is Chris isn't like that. She just wants to be here all the time. She's like addicted to church. Where is Chris? She's at home. Oh, that's right. She's not feeling well. We need to pray for Chris. Her back's really giving her a problem. But she's a churchaholic. We stopped paying her. She'd still show up full time. I mean, that's just the way she is. Why? They love Jesus. They love the church. The Spirit of God's in them. They're faithful. I think of Tom Cash. I think of Steve Hartzell. I think of people that have been serving since before Pastor Betzer wasn't even. There, Tom, right there. Would you stand up, Tom, right there? I just saw you. Perfect timing. I didn't know you were sitting there. Tom, stand up. Stand up, Tom. Steve Hartzell, are you here? I mean, he's been here before, before Betzer. He was like 18 years old or something when he came on the church council. I don't even know how that's possible. But I can't tell you how much help he and Steve Hartzell and the council members are, but for decades. They like to rotate off the council, but they're looking for young men and women to hand the baton to that will be faithful. How do, you, how do you think our auditorium looks clean and looks great? Don't you think that? Yes. You want to know why? Because one lady's been cleaning this entire building for over 40 years. Her name is Elizabeth. 40 years. First thing I notice is my ADD thing. And I started watching the show Monk. Adrian Monk loved that show. But I'm like, Monk. It's like I walk in. I'm like, whoop, whoop, whoop. I see everything. And I walk in. I go, it's clean. The foyer's clean. The bathrooms are clean. Everything's clean, so it's clean for you. Amen? It doesn't just happen. Angels don't come in and clean the church. A lady named Elizabeth for over 40 years, and folks, when I tell you every single time I've seen her, she is always moving, always cleaning, always picking up something, always emptying trash, always doing something. I'm like, I don't know how we'll be able to replace her. She's almost in her mid-70s, and she's like Jack LaLanne. I'm praying another 10 years. Jesus, another 10 years. And can I tell you, she has the joy of the Lord in her face. Seriously, and there's times that the worship team will be practicing. I'll catch her, and she'll stop for a moment. And I'll walk up, and I always go give her a hug. And I'm Elizabeth, and she's got tears in her eyes. Oh, I can feel God's presence. Oh, I just love his church. And she just goes and keeps on cleaning. How many things has she done that nobody saw? How many things has Ashley done, or Pastor Dave, or Chris Thomas, or Tom, or Steve? How many things have you done that nobody saw, but God sees them? And God rewards them. Amen? Amen. Amen. I want to finish with this. Here's the aha moment for me. Here was the moment of discovery. When I looked at all the Greek words, let's go this way, left to right. When I looked at all the Greek words, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, right? Adjectives, 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 and it gets to faithfulness, and there's only one Greek word that God uses for both faith and faithfulness, and he uses a noun, not an adjective. In the English, we could say love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control. We add the words fullness, because here's the point. In the Greek, what God is saying is, if you have his faith, his substantive, something, weighty faith in your life, you will be faithful. 
So I want to ask you this. Are you being absolutely faithful in every area? Because when I looked at the Greek scholars, when they talked about faith as a virtue, they all used these words, absolute trust, absolute surrender, absolute belief in Jesus. But talking about an ethical virtue, talking about the flowing of God's faith in our lives, utterly reliable, utterly trustworthy, utterly loyal. God uses that noun instead of an adjective because faith is something that you receive and obtain and if you have it, you will be faithful. But here's the, here's the question. Absolutely. Absolutely. What does that sound like? If we had to put a number on absolutely, what would it be? My favorite Floridian slang, it would be 100%. 100%. You and I are being faithful or, or releasing that faith, but how many of us, if we're honest, we're not 100% in every single one of those categories? And God knows that. He's a God of grace, but he's still saying that he can still do the deeper work, the greater work. How many of you, when you hear this, you're like, I want to be more faithful? Amen. What has to happen is, is we have to admit, God, in this area or that area, I need your help. I need your faith for my situation. I want to share my faith, so I need more of a revelation of your faith in me so I can be a witness. God, I want to believe you, that you're my provider and you're my blesser, that it's not from my paycheck or I'm not going to have to live off of a credit card, that you're going to be faithful to be the one that provides and you're going to be the one that does that for me. Amen? Amen. So let's be honest. How many of you, eyes closed right now, you're saying, God, I am not 100% in certain areas, but I want to be. Would you just lift your hands before the Lord right now in a receiving position? I'm putting both my hands up because none of us are 100% every single one, but God says that he can make us like that, but he has to deposit more of his spirit in you. Would you just cry out to him right now in your hunger and say, God, I want to be more like you. God, I want to live more like you. God, as faithful as you've been to me, I want to be more faithful to you and to others by your spirit. Would you just ask him to receive more of his Holy Spirit right now online as well? Just let him do that work. Just admit we all have our weaknesses. God, turn it into strength. That which used to be a fire, maybe it's grown cold. God, rekindle that fire inside of me again. God, I want to be free. I want to be absolutely free to release all of your goodness and all of your qualities in and through me. It's a work of the Spirit. You can't fake it. You can't do it through religious obligation. He has to do a deeper and a fuller work. Just give that to him right now completely and totally talk to them begin to pray over those issues right now as I talk to another group you're here today and you first of all you need faith in Jesus Christ you believe him here you believe in him here but it hasn't happened in your heart or spirit because you haven't let him in and if that's you today or you online you can make that decision in this moment in this instance say God drop a seed of who you are, that seed of faith of the divine in me. Say, Jesus, come into my life. I'm sorry I kept you away. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Do what only you can do. Wash me clean. I believe that you're the son of God. I believe that you died on a cross and rose again for victory over sin. Do that work in me. Today I declare you as God. And I ask you to help me, to make me, make you my best friend. Thank you for chasing me and loving me. Today I follow you and today I love you back. Amen. Amen. It's that simple. It's spirit to spirit, the core of who you are and the core of who God is. And that's where life happens. If you made that decision, you're feeling that warmth in your heart. You're feeling his presence, his love. Just rest in it. Just stay concentrated on him. Just let him love you and love through you and just talk to him. It's just talk and just being yourself to him. We would love to talk with you afterwards if you give us a chance to do that. Can we welcome those that maybe prayed that prayer right now? Also online. Never forget that day. All things new. Amen. I'm going to ask that you stand.
I want to finish with this. We're going to sing this song of the goodness of God. But here's God's promise. If you are faithful and if you release faithfulness in your life, God will entrust you with even more. Matthew chapter 25, verse 21. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much and enter into the joy of your master. The other text basically says at the end of this life, when he sees our faithfulness here on earth, he is going to give us, let, give us the ability to rule and reign over everything he has in heaven. How exciting is that? Your faithfulness is rewarded. Amen? Your faithfulness is recorded and your faithfulness is rewarded. So let's just be free. The last thing I want to say is maybe there's still a few of you that you're just broken, you're just down, you just have come to the end, you feel hopeless, you feel faithless. I'm not saying that you've lost your faith in who God is, but you've lost faith for your situation or for your life. Life can do that. There's only been one time in my Christian walk that I had an issue, I had a circumstance where I was so beaten down I literally didn't have faith for that situation anymore. I was faithless. I don't have time to go into the story, but I will tell you this. His word is true. Romans chapter 3, verse 3. Those of you that you're broken heart, you're at the end. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. God is faithful even to the faithless, such as his goodness. So God's goodness is not determined by our reaction to him. God's goodness is constant. His agape love, his grace is constant. And if that's you today, even when you feel like you've got nothing left, let him just speak new faith into your situation. I'm gonna invite the prayer teams to come forward. We're gonna finish with this song. And then Pastor Dave will close with a closing prayer blessing. Let's sing about God's goodness. Hello, church family. My name is Pastor Jason, and I'm so glad you joined us today. I hope and pray that the worship and the word spoke to your heart today, and we pray that God will continue to encourage you. Let me pray for you. God, those watching online today, will you bless them? Will you encourage them? Will you let them know that you are for them in whatever situation they're in, wherever they're located, let them know you're their God and you're fighting for them on their behalf. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, if you have any questions about our church services or you need more information, you can check us out on our social media apps or you can go to famfm.com to get more information. We hope to see you here soon. We love you all. God bless.